Good afternoon. Thanks for attending. Uh, in this session, we are going to take a look into network about disk encryption and highlight some of the usability improvements that we made to make the task of keys rotation simpler. So let's get started. So this is a brief agenda. I'm going to give you a brief over overview of the project's thing in Clevis. And then we are going to the key rotation procedure, and we are going to see a short demo on this. So eventually, people start encrypting disks for getting more security. But basically, it has a trade-off that it requires you to type the password manually upon boot so that you can unlock the data, and the boot procedure continues. Like in here, we see a, a typical boot screen, like we have an unencrypted disk. It's, requesting us to type the password. So we can simply type it, and it's OK. Or we can use what we call network bound disk encryption, NVD for short, the acronym. Basically, it's going to allow us to unlock a disk without need to manually type the password. And now you're going to see how exactly this works. So we have a server-side counterpart, like a, a demo. It is a summit to run in a controlled environment, for instance, a data center or corporate network. And we have a specific protocol that's going to uh, dictate how the data is going to be transferred between the client and the server. Essentially, it's some software JSON over HTTP. And we use uh, this key exchange, Macallan Relia, which are two headhunters. I believe the second person is here. I saw him yesterday, I guess. <laughs> so. It's based on Diffie-Hellman and IES, and this secret does not leave the client. So that's useful for what we want to do here. On the client side, we have Clevis. This is going to be uh, responsible for the autonomous decryption. Uh, the configuration for it is also using JSON, and we support, it for now, three different plugins that we call pins. Like, we have a pin called Tang, in which case, you can bind the disk to a specific tank servers or a set of servers. We have a TPM2 pin that can use the trusted platform module that may be available. And we have, we have a third pin called SSS, which is Shamer Secret Sharing. So for the tank pin, this one allow us to bind uh, a disk to a tank server. And that's where the name network bound comes from. So you have, we are going to have some sort of secret tied to a specific server. Uh, like the SSH protocol, it's also trust on first use. So we are going to see the key of the server, and we are decide or not if we should uh, accept it or not. It also supports offline enrollment, which means that we can previously download uh, Advert the advertisement from the server, like the keys it provides. And so we can do the encryption itself offline without need to access it. And here we can see an example of how we can use it. Like basically, we have a command clavis lux bind, minus d we specify the device that we are interested in binding. Then we, we use the specific pin that we want to use, in this case, tang. And here's the JSON configuration. We have a URL and basically the server itself. Like, let's try to see it in this VM. This VM basically has both Clevs and Tang installed locally. Let me see if it's working. Tang is going to list it on the port number 80, so I can check if we have a, OK, it gives me the advertisement, which is this payload. And I have a VDA3 device, which is encrypted. I'm going to use this to bind to the server just to see if it works. So I use a command like that one. Clavis looks bind minus D. By the way, is the font size OK? Or? OK, thank you. And then I specify the plugin, tang, and the configuration. Basically, the URL. In this case, it's local. So localhost. So here I see the key from the server, 
and I can't translate it or not. Let me translate it. And at this point, I'm prompted to type the uh, Nesdiction looks password for, for this device. What we are doing here is basically creating, oh, I probably made a mistake here. Let's try again. It's, it's gonna create a new passphrase and add to another look slot in this device. So we should have now two, like one that already existed when the device was created and one that was added just now. However, we added it encrypted and we are gonna need this tongue server to do the decryption for us, at which point we can actually do the decryption of the device, the unlocking of the device. So just to verify that we actually have the two key slots. Yes, so we have key slot zero and one. We keep checking. You see that we actually have a token tied to key slot one. That was Clevis just did. So this is the Clevis pin. The SSS pin, it implements this algorithm, which means secret sharing. Basically, it allows us to divide a secret in parts, different parts. And we can also determine like, the number of parts, the minimum number of parts we need to recover the secret. This also allows us, in this case, to mix pins together. And basically, you can create sophisticated unlocking policies. Here's a simple example of how we can code use this. Like, they use the same clevis looks bind the device the pin SSS, we define the threshold as one, which basically means that we need only one of these to succeed. You see I'm now using two tank servers, so one of, this, one of these could be down, we could still unlock the disk. So it can be used for high availability, like this is the primary use case in this example. We also have a TPM2 pin. Basically, it's going to use a trusted platform module that implements the V2 specification 2.0. As of now, we support state key PCR policies. So basically, you can seal data based on the value of the PCRs. And here is also an example. Similar everything. The plugin in this case, TPM2. And here, we are tied to the specific PCR ID. And now we go to the key rotation mechanism. We are mostly interested in Tang, because Tang is the network part, so network bound disk encryption. Let's focus on Tang. Tang uh, uses two keys, two keys on the server, like we have one signing key and one encryption key. And there is also like, like in security, like in passwords, we are uh, supposed to rotate them like periodically. Like. So eventually we should go to the server and do the key rotation, which essentially is, let's generate new keys, new pair of keys, which we can do by using one script that is provided with tongue. And we also should uh, tell the system that the current keys like, should not be advertised anymore. So, okay, now we have new keys, the other ones, let's not advertise them. So, in practice, let's see how it works. In this directory, vardb tang, we have the actual keys tang is using. So here are the two keys. And I'm gonna create a new pair of keys to rotate this. I can use that uh, binary tang d keygen and specify a new directory. So at this point I have four. So I'm gonna now move the other ones. Basically, I'm gonna rename them and prefix with a dot. And from that point on, Tongue will not advertise them anymore. They still exist. If you have clients using them, like that device that I bound it, they still will work because they still are there. So let me rename these two. So at this point, I have two keys and two keys that are now rotated. From the server side, that's it. It's very simple. 
However, now comes the issue in the clients. Like I mentioned, since the case still exists, I can still unlock the device using them. Which I can test, for instance, Clevis Lux unlock. I pass the device. And I can specify a name for the device once it opens. So when we do this, it's going to contact Tang, do the key exchange, <coughs> and unlock the device. You can see the device is now open. So everything worked as expected. So from the client side, everything is working as expected. The client doesn't know that the key was actually rotated, because it still exists. Let's go back to the presentation. On the client side, as I said, it's hard to verify that the case were rotated because basically everything works the same. So how can we actually check if the case were rotated or not? Like, it's possible to do. Basically, you have to manually load the data, the metadata from the Lux slot, decrypt, go through every single device, every single hoop, and actually compare what are the keys that are marked in there. You can also go to the tank server and see what keys it's advertising. So it's possible to do, not impossible, but not trivial, and very highly error prone. And actually, it's hard to even know what kind of configurations we are using. Like, assistant administration managers, like hundreds of devices, probably they have hundreds of tank servers or TPM configurations. So we go to here, like, okay, I have here, what kind of configuration am I using here? Obviously, it should be documented, but there should be an easier way for us to get this kind of information. So now we have some usability issues that we are trying now to resolve or improve the situation. Because on the client side, we need to do some things like rotate the keys, but we don't even know if they were rotated. Actually, we don't even know what kind of configuration we are using. And now we have a few new subcommands like this Clevis Lux list that's going to display basically the configuration that's been used by a particular device. The user is simple, like the other one, the bind. Basically, I pass the device. And here's how it works. Clevis Lux list minus D, dev VDA3. So now I see that in key slot number one, I'm using Tang as the plugin, and here's the configuration that is being used. And the configuration I see here, it's actually ready to be used like in Tang itself, in, in Clevis itself. I can Clevis looks bind minus D and use this configuration as it's in here. So now we have a simple way to at least know what Tang servers are bound to, or in case of TPM or PCR device, PCR IDs we are using. So it's now simple to do that. And we also are providing two new subcommands to help you with the key rotation. We share the Clevis Lux report. Usually they're similar, however, we need to specify the slot. So it's going to tell us uh, whether the keys that we are using this device are, were rotated or not. So I can use it. Clevis looks report, specify the device, and the slot. And now it's telling me, oh, this particular key that we have in our metadata is not being advertised by the server, so it was probably rotated. The same one with the second key. Onset, uh, shows this to us, it actually asks whether we want to regenerate the binding, like to update the keys. Like, do you want to actually rotate them? Yes, so it's gonna use the existing configuration. And at this point, I can again provide the an existing looks password. And it's going to basically do a rebind. Like, OK, let's rebind now using the current keys that we have. Keys were success successfully rotated. So if I, for instance, run the command again, 
no output because, okay, the keys we are using are now current. So this is basically to help with the key rotation on the client side. The service side was never a problem. It's a very simple operation, but on the client it was complicated. So the third command that we are adding is the Clevis Lux regen. This one is going to do the rebinding. And then in our example that we did right now, it was actually used from the report. It offered to run it, and we accepted it and run it. So this, now we are going to show a demo, which is basically what I, I've just showed it. In this case, this demo is, a, as I said, is a single VM. It has both Clevis and Tang. Since I'm not demonstrating <coughs> an actual unlock, like I'm not rebooting the VM, so this is perfect for our experiments. And the key rotation, both the client server and client side. So here you have some useful links, like the, pro the projects are open source, so everyone is welcome and encouraged to contribute, so get involved. Here's Tang and Clevis. And here are two useful talks and slides from both Nathaniel McCallum from a DevConf a couple of, a couple of years ago, securing automated decryption. Basically, in here, it introduced Tang and Clevis and all the mathematical details of that. And there is a second talk. This one is more recent, I believe, from last week. Clevis and Tang, securing your secrets at rest. So here is the actual talk, the video. It was a very interesting talk. And basically, that was it. So please, go ahead. Key rotation. Uh, but can this be automated yes. in a secure way? So let's say uh, to provide the, the key and it automatically compares and if it matches, then it accepts it because uh, otherwise it doesn't scale. Yes, no. Okay, so the question was if we can basically automate this. Yes, we can. Let me check it. Clevis Lux report. So basically, you can specify both a quiet mode so it doesn't really prompt anything. And there is also minus R, like you are already answering the question if it should regenerate. So you can script this and even pass. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you can, you can automate this, basically. Okay. I mean, it was thought of that uh, as a possibility, and we can do it. I don't remember all the details, but it's possible to do it. Yes? So, firstly, how are you protecting the key material in transit? Because you're using HTTP here, not HTTPS. So, when that information is coming from the server, how are you ensuring that the key can't be intercepted? Can you repeat the question? Yes, he's asking if how we can protect the key. Okay, and actually that's an area that I'm not an expert. So basically this key exchange does that for you. Like it protects that for you. That first talk that I mentioned is gonna answer your question. Okay, so they're already doing something. Yes, to I mean TLS is not even necessary. Yeah. Right. The, the private key is never actually exchanged. The, the, the secret the never. Token locally, that's, that's doing it. Yeah. The token uses the public key from the Tang server and yeah. And secondarily, the implication from what you were showing, and again, it might not actually be how it works, is that you don't have a unique key per device. Um, I mean, what you were showing on the VM implied, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong here, and that's not how it actually you works. What, implied, you have different, you have what do you mean by not a unique key per device? Usually, every server is going to have unique keys. I mean, that's the, the recommended way for deploying. Okay, so every device or every, every server? Every Clevis client generates a unique key. Sorry, it's okay. That exchange is happening on the board. No, every time you bind a device on the client side, a new key is going to be generated with the same entropy of the master key. Yep. So we are going to encrypt that key using the exchange, 
and we are going to store that encrypted. So when we do the exchange to retrieve the, the key for decryption, then we unlock. But every passphrase added is unique. And also from the server side, every key of a par key is also unique. I have another question. OK. Um, at the moment, my PAN servers are running on RHEL 7. How do, can I migrate them to RHEL 8? Migrate to RHEL 8. Uh, since you probably have, the question was, how can we migrate a TAN server running on RHEL 7 to RHEL 8? Basically, not much change in terms of semantics of configuration. So I suppose if you have clients using the keys that you have, you are going to migrate those. Like, you are going to do an installation on Hell 8 and get the keys that you have available in the VARDB tank. Those are the keys. So just copy, just the, copy the keys, start the tank server. It should advertise this. Your clients, you talk to them, and it will work. Yes. Yes, ideally. I, ideally, we're going to use like a configuration like this SSS example, like with at least two or three or four servers for high availability. But in terms of configuration, just copy your keys to the new server and we're okay. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, in case of high availability, you have to synchronize database through tax servers or public servers? No, uh, you mean to separate. I mean, if I understood the question, he's asking if, he, in case of high availability, we have two separate databases. Okay. Actually, there are two different machines. Different if you are following the recommendations, each of them have unique, a unique pair of keys. They are not the same. So when you are going to do the binding, it's actually going to ask you to trust the keys from all the servers listed. So you are going to trust twice in this case, like the keys from the first server and the keys from the second server. Remember that the servers do not have a copy of the client keys at all. Yeah, I'm just Thank you. So when you do the bind, it is some configuration you need to basically do the bind to both. What if you define a low balance uh, URL, like in DNS like, I don't know, with the service record or something like that. Would you still need to, would you still be able to resolve all the service behind the DNS and the oh, What matters in this case is the threshold one. Like if you can reach one of them, you can decrypt the data. Like in terms of load balance, uh, it's not, a, if I understood correctly, it's going to resolve maybe a different server every time, is that? Or several. Or several. Yeah, in this case, you have to make sure at least the keys are the same. I mean, if you have, you have to first bind two of them, like this, like a list of them. And then when you are resolving, you are basically resolving one of them randomly. Mm -hmm. If those keys are the ones that it was bound to, bound to it's going to work. So it's possible to do it. But you probably would have to list individually like the 10 of them. We have 10, you list 10. When we're resolving, you probably resolve. Right, but would defeat the purpose if I want to decouple the configuration in the clients from the number of time servers I have, because the major they grow, maybe they don't use the computer change. to make sure that your secrets database and the end server is the same on all Yeah. Right, so I need to see the server from the client sure. and it doesn't know. Yes, that's one possibility. Like copy the keys, it's not really recommended. Or you can eventually, like if you are adding or reducing the number, you can rebind it. Sure. Like probably it's simple because that can be automated. Thanks. Just one final thing. And I've been with a customer before who's deployed very similar technology and their server-side key storage was hit by ransomware. So if you do consider deploying this, make sure you have offline backups of that server-side done at least every few hours. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that meant they threw 2,000 laptops in the bin. Yeah. Because it was quicker and cheaper for them to do that and just tell their staff to go and buy a new laptop. And it was for them to try and fix it otherwise. In this, you usually want to leave like a password and slot zero as a backup or something similar. Yeah. And then you just, who cares about the tank 
servers you had. The fact that key servers got hit by ransomware probably shows you the confidence of that organization. <laughs> You're probably storing the actual yeah, secrets too. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Uh, basically, we could like continue the JSON configuration, put a comma here, put the name of the order. You could even use SSS recursively. Like in a first step, you want to validate the TPM. In a second step, you want to validate a set of tongue servers. So it's possible. And I'm afraid we are out of time now. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>